The title of the sermon today is Encouragement in Jesus and Participation in the Spirit. The scripture reading will be from Philippians 2, 1 to 13. And today we're going to address and talk about the fact that we have the mind of Christ, that it has been given to us, what it means, and how it impacts our lives as we relate to one another. So we'll have the scripture reading by Mike from Philippians 2, 1 to 13. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. These are the living word of God. Thank, Thank you, you for the, for gift, the gift of the, of the mind, mind of Christ. Of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, this letter to the Philippians was written while Paul was in prison. And he was probably in prison in Rome. Um, and it's not unlike the situation today. Paul wrote to the Philippians because there were divisions in the church. There were factions, there were different opinions, there were, and people were not necessarily of one mind all the time, and certainly that is uh, something that we experience in our, in our day, and some preach Christ with an attitude of rivalry, of envy, and some actually wanted to hurt Paul in the way they preached about Jesus. It's hard to understand, but the human heart is able to do anything and so Paul had to contend with that and, and so but on the other hand there were those who were preaching Christ out of love and from a pure heart and so they and Paul who was in prison said to them something quite amazing he said that Paul was in prison uh, because to defend the, the gospel. I was hearing this morning about a pastor actually in Africa who talked about, who was uh, talking about God and talking about Jesus Christ and all that and he, they put him in prison uh, for a, a number of years and he, had, he has been stopped many times because of his beliefs in Christ. Um, so we can be very thankful in Canada that we can still, we are free to, to talk about God and uh, we don't have the police at our door uh, when we have worship services. So that's a real, that's, that's a real blessing. And so Paul says, you know, with those who were preaching Christ for various reasons and even those who were, who were preaching Christ out of rivalry and, and envy, Paul then says, then what? Then what? What do we do with that? And his answer is, is quite interesting. He said that he rejoiced in every way because regardless of their motives, the name of Christ was being elevated. That is quite an attitude, isn't it? <laughs> that that he, he realized that the name of Christ was being elevated whether people had pure hearts or didn't have pure hearts. And so, and Paul living in prison and knowing his future in Christ, 
had, was of two minds, if you will. He had two desires that were very strong. And, and he said that the first desire was that he would just die and be with God. He said that would be much better. Um, and, on, and he also said, but because you still need me on account of you, I'm going to, I know I'm going to remain in the flesh because it was more necessary on the account of the, Philippi the Philippians and probably the other churches that he has begun. So Paul had a very outgoing and sacrificial attitude, which is the mind of Christ, really, when we stop and think about that. And uh, so he, he, he wanted to, he had no doubt that he would remain to help those Christians uh, in their progress, in the joy of the gospel, and in their faith. So they would have, and he said that they would have ample cause to glorify Jesus Christ because Paul would be coming to them, that, that Paul would be delivered from, from, these, from these chains. And interestingly enough, Paul said also to them, to stand for he said, don't be afraid of the people that oppose the gospel. Don't be afraid of them. And uh, he said, and he said that they were to be, because there were opponents, there were adversaries, there were, there were people engaged in opposing the true message of the gospel. And Paul says that it was a sign of their destruction. And those that were faithful, it was a sign of their salvation in Jesus Christ. And he said that he told them something that is quite amazing afterwards. He told them that it was granted to them to suffer for the sake of Christ. That God granted them if you will, the opportunity to suffer, they were granted something that was given to them to suffer for the sake of Christ. And this is, this is something I, I suppose that is hard to, uh, to phantom because when we suffer for the sake of Christ, the human mind doesn't say, well, God is giving, God is granting that to me to use my suffering is an example of however for God's purposes but sometimes when we suffer and if we suffer for the sake of Christ then Christ uses that for his for his purpose and to mold us into his image that is the good news and I I realize that it's not human thinking it's the way God thinks so and he also went on to say, you know, that Paul was going through a conflict, a conflict that was going to continue. And he said to the Philippine brother, brethren, you are going through a conflict as well that is going to continue. It's not going to end tomorrow. It's going to continue. And he encouraged them. And, uh, so, and he also went on from that point of view to say, you know, how are the brethren to perceive or to see one another. And this is very important. And he tells them that because on the basis that they have the mind of Christ, that they have Christ living in them, in other words, that they have God's, Christ's Holy Spirit living in them. Just as there were difficult people and people distorting the gospel in that day because Jesus had said in Matthew 24, 24 and Mark 13, 22, he says Jesus had talked about false Christ and false prophets. It's interesting in the, the book of Philippians, Paul, if you look at Acts 16, about 49, 49 AD, not very long after the death of Jesus Christ, Paul began the church there in Philippi. And the letter was written from Rome about 60 to 62 AD. 
So if you look at the death of Christ in the 30s, the early 30s, that's not very long, and already the gospel was being distorted. That's very, that's very close. You had people living at that time who knew Christ, and yet it was already being distorted. So we should not be surprised today that the gospel is going to be distorted as well by some people. So that's why we have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And we're commanded throughout the Bible to keep our eyes on Jesus. So the, the message of the gospel is really the best news that could be given to anyone. Um, but the, the carnal human mind does not receive the message of the gospel, it says. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, in Romans 8, 7. So what happens is that we, that the person who is not focused on Christ at all is hostile to the message, so the Holy Spirit has to eventually to convince that person to, 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 to think otherwise. Because otherwise, he'll just, he'll just say in opposition. And we were all in that state at one point in our lives. We didn't want to hear about God. We laughed at it. And if we look at our former lives, it did not reflect unity with Christ. It reflected disunity with Christ, if you will. You know, in the French culture, uh, I, just talking for me, it was brought up in an environment where swearing was common. So you just use that, and, uh, and we use words about God that were really insulting and really blasphemous when you, when you think of it, uh, the way we spoke. Because at that particular time, I did not know who God was, and I did not even think about it, what I was doing. So but when, call, Jesus, when God calls people to himself, he begins to reveal himself. He begins to reveal who he is, and, and God revealed... Jesus revealed himself to Paul. He's one of the apostles. He reveals himself to Paul. And, so, and he continues to reveal himself to the church today. And, and that is important to, to realize. So how does Jesus reveal himself today is the question. How does he do that? Well, in John 16, 14, 15, we read that he, talking about the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is the one who glorifies Jesus, and he, he is the one who teaches us who God is and how to live in Christ. The Holy Spirit does that. It's interesting, as we read the next scripture in Ephesians 3, 1 to 5, we read that for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. And then he goes on, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generation, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets. How? By the Holy Spirit. So there's a mystery in Christ. How can you explain, or how does it make sense to the human mind, how can we truly understand that when Jesus came to the earth as the incarnate Son of God and he died on the cross 
that God was never killed. That the man Jesus was killed, God was never killed. That God always remained Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, that just blows the mind when we stop and think about it, really. There's a mystery that we will only understand in the fullness of the kingdom. But that's what the Bible teaches, and that is very encouraging news. So God, and we need to understand as we look at this, that God is revealing himself to his people, and it's not because of we are superior in intelligence or anything like that. It's a gift of God's grace. Because we, we haven't done anything to be able to qualify for this. It's just God has opened our minds to the scripture through his church, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that, how God, that is how God, God, God works. And he's, he's working via his apostles, via the prophets, through his, through his church, via the written word. And the Holy Spirit brought what, what is to be written, what was to be written to the mind of the apostles to be able to transmit that message to us. So it's, it's really a question of faith. So we have to realize and ask, what is important? What, what is it that the Holy Spirit has revealed? Did he come to reveal when the end of the age would be? Did he came to reveal prophecy, who the beast is, or whatever? No, he came to give insight into the mystery of Christ. That is the message of the Holy Spirit. That is central to the gospel. And it's important to realize that as God's people. And we need to remember that the whole God is involved in our salvation, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the Godhead, the three persons have distinct responsibilities but remain one God. So we need, as we read these verses, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus because he came to reveal to us in the flesh who God is. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, and that's why the little clip that we saw from Ravi Zechariah is important. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So it's important that we keep grounded in the word of God and we feed on it every day. Because, you know, as Ravi says, you know, when we feed on God's word, we're able to see the world through God's eyes. When we don't, we see the world through our eyes. And that is, that is very important. And, uh, you know, we, as we read the Bible, we don't understand everything. And that is okay, because God reveals, as we seek him, God is going to add his grace and knowledge. He, he, he'll help us to understand what's, what we need. And our response is to respond in faith to, to what he's telling us in obedience. So... Because Paul is obviously an, he's an apostle, he's part of the foundation of the church, it's very important that we listen and that we take into consideration what he's teaching us about God, about how we ought to live as, as God's people. So he talks about the mind of Christ. Let's read what he says. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing of to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, 
and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what Jesus did for us is absolutely astounding. And since we have his mind, he has given us his mind, we'll have some of the attitudes of Jesus by because it's going to transpire because that is our new life you know there's a there's a heresy in the in the church that is started way early and that it's still going on it's called docetism and maybe you want to remember that word but what's important to remember about that it's the doctrine is the doctrine that the phenomenon of Christ is historical and bodily existence and above all the human form of Jesus was a mere semblance without any true reality. Bodily is to be taken, is broadly is to be taken as the belief that Jesus only seemed to be human and that his human form was an illusion. <laughs> Wikipedia says it, so what happens, they, they say that, well, you know, he, he was not really a human. He had all, he was God, which is true, but he lived as a human being empowered by the Holy Spirit. He took our, on our flesh. And to say that Jesus was just an illusion and that he was not really a human being when he walked on the face of the earth is a major problem because the Bible teaches us completely otherwise, doesn't it? It does. So we need to understand the following. And I'd like to read that. It's from the crucifixion, understanding the death of Jesus Christ by Fleming Rutledge. She said, God made Jesus to be sin even though he knew no sin. And in that indescribably terrible and unique transaction, Jesus apparently felt the full force of our separation from the Father. That is what he underwent in order to remake our human nature. Not to improve it, not to re-engineer it altogether. He became sin. We became the righteousness of God. So, God did not come to the earth to make human beings better. He came to make dead people alive. And that is very important to understand because when we say that we are born again, it means that the old nature is dead. It died in Christ. And we are resurrected and have a new life. And this new life is given to us. As we come, it's available for everyone. But it comes a reality when we have, have faith in Christ. We have this new life. Maybe we don't feel it, but we have it in faith. Because our life over time is going to change. It's going to be, because you are not the same today as when you were called. Because of, you have this new life. So basically, Paul is encouraging the, Philippine, the, the Philippians to live in this new identity and Jesus was not in competition with the Father when he came to the earth. In fact, he submitted completely to God the Father for us. And he completely defeated sin and death at the cross. And the cross is the culmination of the mission of Jesus Christ on the earth. He had to go through that. He lived the perfect life. And then he had to go through that suffering so that we would not be under the dominion of sin and death anymore. There's no other way that we can, because though sin and death is a power, if you will. And there's no other way that we can come off from under that power except for Jesus doing what he did. He accepted the consequences of sinful human nature and he died. And he died and he humbled himself to that point 
out of love for us. So you'll, as we, as Mike wrote, read those scriptures, Paul said, the beloved brethren, my beloved brethren. Well, where does he take that language? He took that language because Paul had the mind of Christ and how does God call us? He calls us his beloved. And that's why Paul uses that language because we are beloved of God and, and we can say that we are beloved to one another, if you will, because that's how Paul felt, have the mind of Christ. Doesn't mean that we agree with everything that the other is saying or doing as God's people, but we love one another because we have the mind of Christ. So apart from placing our faith in Jesus Christ, we cannot overcome sin and death. We're stuck there. That's the only way out. It's through Christ. And he's the one who does it. It's not us. It's all of God and none of us. My wife was talking with someone this past week, and uh, there's someone who died who was strong in the faith. And this person told my wife, well, he's surely in heaven because he was a strong man of faith. And my wife told him his behavior, told her friend, his behavior did not bring him to heaven. <laughs> He's with Christ because what Christ has done for him. Not because of what he's done, even if he appeared a giant in the faith, which was a gift of God. But he, it's not on his merit that he's with God. It's, with, it's because of he accepted the merit of Jesus Christ upon his life. That's why. And that's the, the, the rightness of God. So how are we to perceive others? Well, Paul says that we are to perceive others more significant than ourselves. And he says, you know, don't only look at your interests, look at the interests of others. He doesn't say, well, don't look at your interests because we have, we have to look after ourselves as well. But we have to look at the interests of other people of our brothers and sisters. And these are very powerful instructions because, you know, I, in political systems or in other systems, you know, we can follow somebody who is a hero for us. But following Jesus is not the same thing. You know, if I follow a politician, for example, or someone, a guru of some kind, you know, that guru doesn't come to live in me. It's, I'm left on my power. But when I follow Jesus, then Jesus comes to live in me, and I live in him, and he lives his life, and I participate in Christ in what he's doing. So in following Jesus, it's very different than following some hero in this world. Very different. Because we participate in what Jesus is doing. So being in Christ is a miracle. Having the mind of Christ is a miracle. Is a miracle. God says that he would come to the earth. In the Old Testament, he says, I'm going to give you a new heart. So giving us a new heart, that's a miracle from God. It's not something that we give ourselves. It's something that God does and he has promised to do from all eternity, and he verbalized it in Jeremiah. If you look at that, that's the superiority of the new covenant. The old covenant was based on physical promises. The new covenant is based on better promises. And the better promises is that we, God is going to transform humanity, the human heart, from the inside out. And he did that by the power of humility, by the power of the crucifixion by giving himself for us to break the oppressive, the oppressiveness of sin and death and of the devil and all the, the, the other powers that exist in the universe. So 
he humbled himself and he became sin for us. He became a curse for us. And we read that in, he said, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. The New King James says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That he might become, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And God, who is God? God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one God. We become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That is powerful. If you think of it, that we become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. It's a gift that God gives us. And we have it now. And we're going to see the fullness of it at the resurrection for all eternity in our relationship with God as adopted son and daughters in Jesus Christ, in the man Jesus Christ. And then he says in Galatians 3.13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on the tree. If you look at Deuteronomy where this is quoted, you know, those are describing people who are very sinful, perpetrators, victims, and everybody. So Christ was cursed on the tree for us, and he condemned human nature, and he became that for each and every one of us, for, for humanity, if you will. He died in his person, so that we can have life. So when we stop and think of, of that, that God who is Jesus, who is perfect, never sinned, rules the universe, Jesus, becomes a puny little man. Because if you go to a high-rise building and you, use, you see people walking on the street, they're not very big. We're not very big. We're just little, we, we don't have to go very high. We look like little ants. And if you go a little higher, we disappear. <laughs> so Jesus came to the earth as one of us, took our corrupt human nature so that we can become the righteousness of God in, in him. That is the beautiful news of the gospel. So again, and then Paul says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work of his good pleasure. So he tells us that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And God works in us. How does God work in us? By being in un unity with him. He abides in us. We abide in him. And God gives us the desire to do to will, you know, the will that we have to please God in every aspect of our lives, and that comes from God. It doesn't come from us. That's a gift of God. And to work for his good pleasure, we want, because when we understand how loved we are by God, we want to please him. You know, the, the marriage relationship is a type of Christ in the church. So in marriage, you know, as a husband, I want to please my wife. And it's true for, for all, you know, as we come, as we grow in Christ, that's true of all Christian husbands. We want to please our wives and vice versa for the wives. So, but, so when we understand how loved we are by God, we want to glorify him. We want to please him. We want to, not because we have to, because we are in a love relationship with God who loves us and gave himself for us. So we are to, God helps us with the mind of Christ to live out that Trinitarian relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who are completely for one another. Jesus said this, and this is very important. He said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they, might, that they may be all one, 
all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then in John 17, 20, 22, he says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. That the world may know, the world doesn't know that now, but one day the world will know that we are as loved by God the Father as the Father loves the Son. In fact, the Father sent the Son to give us life through faith in Him. So, so do we really believe that? That, <clears throat> that phrase that God, the Father, loves us as much as He loved Jesus Christ? By faith, eh? To say, I'm loved by the Father as much as God the Father loved Jesus Christ. In, I, in Christ, I become the righteousness of God. We put all these things together. And when we stop and think of it, God invested his life completely in all of us. So we are to be willing to love one another, fellow Christians and others, sacrificially, and to invest in other people's lives. Jesus completely invested himself in our life. He came to the earth as one of us, died, and investing in one another's lives take time. You know, it, make, it, 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 it takes sacrifice. Sometimes we don't always do what we want, and there's 24 hours in the day and all of that, and, and doing something for somebody else because we love them and we take time to listen, or whatever the need may be, to pray for them. Get on our knees and pray for one another. It takes time. It takes. We, but this is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is liberating us to go from selfishness to a humble servant. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Those who serve. So let us meditate on this passage and respond to God and ask him to have the wisdom, his wisdom, to be able to express his love for us, his outgoing love for us, and his outgoing love for one another. To be able to see one another in the way that Paul explains in this epistles. So we are to share our love with others with humility because of what? Because we've been redeemed. We've been redeemed, all of us. So let us, let us ask God to share this wonderful love with others as we participate in what he's doing in our lives and in the lives of other people. And we need to, let's ask as well, to have the attitude of being willing to invest our lives in other people, with other people as well. As Jesus did. And in the life of the church that the world will know. It. It's important. That how will the world know that we are the children of God? By the love that we have for one another. And that all comes from the mind of Christ. The world will know that one day. So that's why it's important, having the mind of Christ, that we strive for unity. Not backbiting or anything, but that we, because we already have unity in Christ, we are to grow in love for one another. And one day the world will know, hey, why did they love one another so much? Why did they stick with one another? Because they were loved by God. And God loved us, and he still does. So let us pray. Father God, we pause before you at this particular time, so grateful 
that we are your beloved, that you love us as much as you love Jesus Christ. And as we say that, it appears to be not right. Because in our, we know our humanness, we know our sinfulness, or some of it. And yet, Jesus, thank you that you became sin for us, that you became, that you became a curse for us, and that in you, Jesus, that you, that we are the righteousness of God because of what you give to us. Help us, Father, to walk in our new identity, to walk in this love that you have given us that it will just outflow to other people in a way that you want to, in a way that the ways that you empower us. And we give you praise because without you, we cannot do anything. So we trust in you. We want to participate with you and in you. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.